This is a lie, this is a lie to my lord. I can't let it, can't let it shine. Hold on, this is a lie, this lie to my lord. I can't let, can't let, can't let it shine. This lie to mine. I'm gonna let it, gonna let it shine, let it shine on, shine on, let it shine. This is a lie, this is a lie to my lord. This little light, this light of mine, oh, yes, gonna let, let, let it shine. This light of mine, I'm gonna let it, gonna let it shine, let it shine on, shine on, let it shine. In my home, wherever I roam, Lord, I'm gonna let it shine. Yes, gonna let it shine. In my home, wherever. In my home, wherever I roam, Lord, I'm gonna let it, gonna let it shine, let it shine on, shine on, let it shine. Oh, Lord, shine. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to the King Singers. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. I would love to get a chance for each of you to introduce yourself. Maybe uh, give us your name, your part, and how long you've been in the King Singers. Hi guys, I'm called Pat, and uh, I sing high cantina, so sort of the equivalent of soprano if we're in a normal chorus. Um, and I've been in the group. This is my fourth year as a King Singer. My name's Eddie, and I'm the second counter tenor, and I have been in the group since January 2019, so just over a year. Hey guys, um, I'm Julian, I'm the tenor, slightly higher voice, um, and this is my sixth year now. Hey guys, I'm Chris, and I've been in the group for about eight years. Um, I'm first baritone, or tenor with a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Nick, um, I sing second baritone, so between the tenor with a cold and Johnny's luscious bass. Um, I've been in the group also uh, just over a year, I joined at the same time as Eddie. Uh, I'm Johnny, I'm a luscious bass, and... Uh, <laughs> I've been in the group for just under 10 years. Awesome, thank you so much for joining. The, uh, if you don't know, the King Singers was founded in 1968. It has had now 26 different members over those 52 years. Uh, it's earned Grammys, it's earned an Emmy, it's performed in countless live performances around the globe. Um, it's just an incredible group. So my first question is, since we have a few members here who are in their first year, 
what is it like joining such a historic group? Because I kind of imagine it's a little bit like you come in on your first day and there's this big repertoire that they just, mm. <laughs> please memorize that by Tuesday, right? It, it is a little bit like that. Um, but thankfully, my colleagues helped prepare me in the, the, the three or four months beforehand. Um, we had a few rehearsals and I actually shadowed the group um, in Estonia and also when we were in the UK, which was a wonderful opportunity to kind of learn directly because a lot of the singing we do here is very specific to the group and it requires quite a, a flexible voice and um, those few months before I joined um, officially in January last year were invaluable to help learn those skills um, to start with but uh, ultimately it was an absolutely wonderful process because you're all so supportive and lovely oh, and we have oh, such fun traveling the world stop together it so is. That, happens. <laughs> that carries on there's Keep also going. something really amazing about joining, as you say, this group with an incredible heritage. Um, I've nearly 52 years now. Um, the group started in what was it, May the sec May the first in 1968. So if anyone does the Google Doodle thing here, then you know <laughs> we've got something coming up. Um, uh, but uh, everywhere we travel in the world, we meet choirs and singers who say, um, you know, when I was a kid, I used to um, love singing the King Singers arrangements and. Um, there's, uh, just as a little stat for you, there's over two and a half million copies of King Singer's arrangements in circulation in the world. That's awesome. Um, which is incredible. So, yeah, to see the inspiration that the group has provided um, throughout the world of classical music and choral music, sh I should say, is, uh, is really awesome to become a part of that. Uh, it's, it's kind of fascinating seeing the... You watch older interviews. I saw one where you were just the nascent and new to the group, and now you're one of the more <laughs> senior members of the group. So um, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of, I imagine, uh, cultural patterns and norms of the group. How much of that do you feel you all want to keep alive and, and keep the same? Or how much do you say, nope, new people, the culture changes, we're a new group today? What, is, what does that balance look like? I think it varies from like line up to line up. Um, I would say in the group right now, there is a strong respect and love for the things that made the King Singers famous when they started. Um, and I think that that was bringing um, both a human and lightness to choral music, but also kind of bringing the world of just sung music together. It wasn't just classical. It wasn't just kind of college acapella -y stuff. It was kind of everything together. And those principles we really stand by. People need to have a good time. They need to be engaged by us. We want to show that the world of music that you can sing is really broad and we can enjoy it all together. Um, in terms of the specifics, I think that's guided by us. It's not us kind of rehashing the same, the same projects. It's, it's saying like, what do we feel moved to do? It's one of the great joys of being a partnership. Like this is a professional business partnership we are in charge and so we say like uh, we want to do this we will make this happen and so yeah i think we get to decide what it is that we're moved to give to the world at any given time and sometimes that might be something that's happened before and sometimes it might be wildly different uh, given the king singers being founded in 1968 that was the height of eight tracks popularity it was before cds but certainly before spotify or youtube or any of those so i mean just in terms of the culture that drives musicality has changed and where these things are published and how people get access to music. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how these new forces influence what the King Singers is today. I was just going to say, I mean, the LP, I don't think has ever been out of fashion. And I think it's time for us to to, to have, a, have our first LP in about 30 odd years. Um, <laughs> but we are constantly um, looking at the music scene and how people are engaging with music and how they're consuming music. And so, you know, for, we had a recent chat with our record label and now uh, it's gone from a smaller percentage to basically 50-50 in terms of streaming and and CD sales, so we are constantly thinking, right, how do we, how do we engage with, with the streaming services in a way, because you've got about 10, 20, 30 seconds to engage someone before they click next, you know? Um, so you have to think a bit differently. It's not necessarily the concept album where people listen to track one to the end, you know, and that's, that's the journey you want to take them on. It's all shuffle play, and so we have to think a bit more creatively about our projects and things like that and I mean Pat's the guy in our group who um, deals with all our social media and things like that so he's got a few more stats and things on 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 our on our streaming services and things but that, that that's an exciting part of our business as well well I think one artistic challenge to the move towards streaming um, is particularly quite a recent one is the playlist phenomenon 
which means that somehow we've got to maintain our artistic integrity, even though the thing which really pays bills now is being included on a uh, editorial playlist by, say, Apple Music or Spotify or your Google equivalent, whatever it might be. Uh, the, um, the, the danger is, therefore, that everything becomes, oh, we've got to fit to that market and therefore just do sort of relaxing bath music, essentially. <laughs> um, and I think there is an element of that because people associate choral singing with relaxation and reflectiveness, and that's absolutely fine. But I think there is a challenge in the marketplace at the moment of not all running towards the chill-out vibe constantly and trying to maintain a sense of who you are despite what playlists do to people's art do you know what we should actually probably sing the next track because it's like a great example of a piece which <laughs> is which so, you said that we could just jump in do so it. I would, uh, do it but That's what the, you're here for. the next the next one is a great example of a track which is on our latest album finding harmony which i know we'll talk about but it's a song which fits so perfectly with the the message of the album and and it in terms of the musical content it fits very nicely as well and yet it's exactly the kind of music which also fits into kind of like choral chill relaxation without having to be shoehorned in in any way like that's quite nice anyway i hope i haven't oversold it now and you know <laughs> what it's um it's a song in estonian um and it was written by a guy called urma sisask and he grew up in the 60s and 70s while estonia was um fighting for its independence from the soviet union and choral music was a huge part of of that and you know the estonian singing culture is huge so he grew up with these huge protests and rallies in tallinn where people would sing together and that was part of their way of expressing um their national identity and so this is in a mixture of latin and estonian and it's a prayer called heliseb valiadel Ave Maria, 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 Ave Maria,
think the best thing about a cappella is the fact that you can just stand up and just perform it. That's it. I don't have to bring <laughs> instruments on. I, that's amazing. It's quite weird for us to have mics, actually. Like, we're usually always acoustic, so even, even this is kind of a piece of <laughs> apparatus we're not used to. So I would love to talk about Finding Harmony. That track was from your newest album. Um, tell me a little bit about it, because it is, it is a fascinating collection of music. So this is an album that um, was curated in a restaurant in Austria um, where Pat brought this amazing idea to us about the fact that when we were traveling around the world on our 2018 50th anniversary gold tour, um, the world seemed to be, well, it still is, but it was certainly a lot of the places we were going to were sort of geopolitical hotspots. Um, we, we traveled in that year, gosh, um, help me out here. We, we, we went to... Seoul, Beijing, Taipei, Moscow, DC, London, Paris, like, yeah. Where a lot of things in the news were sort of happening and we were going there and yet we were finding that perhaps people on both ends of the of the, the political spectrum were coming to our concerts and for two hours they could at least sit side by side and enjoy the show uh, and that kind of gave us this amazing idea of how music has brought people together across the centuries to to um to help them in times of oppression and whatnot and so then it was a case of right let's go out and do some research so pat and johnny said right we're going to look at different periods of history and we and we each had a uh, a role i think jules and i did a bit of georgia mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, the, the the country, not the state. Um, and uh, I did Australia and New Zealand. Pat, you did. I did the fifteen hundreds in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it. Um, <laughs> um, Johnny. I did everything else. No. <laughs> so you did civil rights in America. We had like yeah, civil rights in America. We had apartheid South Africa, and then lots of periods from the last hundred years, whether that's the Holocaust or. Um, the Manchester bombings or the Time's Up movement, there's music that's been at the heart of all of them in one way or another, whether we realize it or not. And so we, um, and so we, we kind of each had our, our field of expertise and we had to go out and find people who are real leaders in that, in that area because we're not going to just come in and say, hey, we know all that, that there is to know about you know, such and such. So that was a really interesting conversation to, to develop these r relationships across a period of probably 18 months and continuing to this day um, of experts in the field. And they were language coaches, they were arrangers, they were, they were um, musicologists, all sorts of people. And so that's been a fascinating kind of personal journey to, to really learn a lot more about these episodes in history that have created some of the most beautiful music um, or some of the most poignant music or some of the most joyous music to help them get over these in in incredibly tough times. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been a, a voyage of discovery. And, and to this day, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were on the um, BBC News channel and, w and watching people in Wuhan singing from their um, high-rise high buildings um, songs of, of, of um, uh, what, what's the word? Solidarity, you know, um, at, at the sort of complete shutdown of that city. Um, which is amazing. So Finding Harmony is something that's very much alive and, and with us um, at the moment. And that's, that's kind of part of the joy of this uh, album and our mission to, to bring a bit, of, a, 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 you know, a, a bit of love to the world. And, and I think we're not, we're not saying anything through it that people haven't said before in some way or other. It's often said music is a common language that, people, that can bring people together because you don't need to know anything to feel something when you hear or make music. But it's a, a question for us of choosing when we when we're giving performances, we are essentially storytellers, and it's it was for us about choosing in this year, at this point in history, what stories do we want to tell through our songs, through what we choose to sing, and we will always sing music that we enjoy and that we think is beautiful and and interesting. But it was about saying there are some fascinating stories from throughout history, including some pretty niche little bits of history um, from countries that don't often get much of a look in, and finding out how music for them has had such an incredible impact on on their history, on their culture, on their identity. It's been a wonderful experience learning all about these different things. The album has, I think, 19 tracks in 11 different languages, um, and it covers more than a, th is it a thousand years of history, roughly. Um, and it's just been absolutely wonderful learning such uh, a sort of variety of music. I guess the King Singers has always been known for eclectic um, repertoire, and certainly with this album, we have continued that, and it's been such a joy. 
and thank you to my colleagues who set the project up before before I arrived. Um, <laughs> but it was a lot of learning right at the start. <laughs> Although you guys would be really pleased to know that when Eddie came, um, we had a fairly disparate file management system within the group, <laughs> and uh, he insisted, nay, dragged us onto Google Drive. So you'll be <laughs> very pleased to know. <laughs> okay. Should that, we sing you? That was wonderful. <laughs> well done. We could sing you another song now in a language you probably don't speak. Uh, and you might not even ever have heard, which is the uh, Scottish Gaelic language. Anyone want to ensure this? Yeah, this is a beautiful song from the time of the Highland Clearances in Scotland, um, a, a pretty violent period in their history where um, uh, rebels uh, fighting against the, the crown, trying to, trying to keep Scottish um, sort of independence. Uh, if you will, um, were suffered pretty badly at the hands of, of the English crown. Um, and uh, here's a beautiful song written by a guy called John Cameron. It's called Ohi Shimana Morvina, which means how I long for the misty mountains. So it's all about yearning for the way that life used to be before the pretty tough times they went through. Um, it was also sung at JFK's funeral. Um, so yeah, here it is, arranged by the great Scottish composer Sir James Macmillan. is fantastic to see the diverse set of stuff that you put onto Finding Harmony. Um, from 
Kosa to Gaelic to Kesha. I uh, would love to hear a little bit about how you came up with that set list and what that process looked like. That is a challenging one because there was so much more music that we could have included that we didn't. Right? And I think that the, the key point here was to, I always think about it like uh, when you're putting together a, a program or an album, it's like curating an exhibition at a museum, if you're in an art museum, like the, you know, the Whitney or something. And one of the joys you have is you get to decide how the pieces of art are arranged so that you can get the maximum impact out of each one. So if you get loads of things that are really similar next to each other, they may not have the same immediate effect on someone who's receiving it as if they see like five different things and suddenly the particulars of each one stand out more strongly. The juxtaposition. I, exactly. Those juxtapositions are really key. And so I think for, for us, it was like saying, look, there is music from over a thousand years. Let's take music from across a thousand years. There's music in way more languages than this, but let's take a huge number of languages. And still doing so in a way that makes sense in a concert. You don't want to have to explain the story between between each piece. So we'll have like a section about the civil rights movement and a section about the Reformation. So people can get slightly more invested in how music really made a difference. But it was it was saying, okay, what can we do just to to have maximum impact and lots of variety. So it was it was that predominantly. And then it was just, you know, what moves us? You know, we live in England and Ariana Grande, one, doesn't normally appear on a King Singers album. <laughs> Two, she doesn't normally appear on an album with the 16th century English Renaissance composer William Byrd, let alone next to it. Oh, no, that was Kesha, I think. But the, the, but the thing with that song is that One Last Time was the song that all of the artists came on stage to sing together at One Love Manchester, which was the benefit concert that was put on after the Manchester bombings during her concert at the Manchester Arena. And as it was a kind of sign of solidarity of all of the artists she'd invited to come to help support this cause to say, you know, we want to stand up against terrorism and we want to show our love for the city of Manchester. And so that's like a beautiful modern day example of how Finding Harmony is happening today in our own country. And so it's like that spoke to us a lot, which is why it's on there. Um, yeah. I think that's an excellent segue. I would love to hear a little bit more about the King Singers Global Foundation, because that's very much tied into this Finding Harmony mission, isn't it? So I would love to hear a little bit about this charity and what it means to each of you, what it is. So the King Seas Global Foundation um, has two branches in the UK and in the US. And the main purpose of it is really to to do Finding Harmony in real time now. Um, we wanted not just to have an album, but also to be able to help the world through the power of music now. And we're not promising to change the world, but clearly there is um, a lot to be said for healing divides within society through the power of music. It's a universal language. And that really is at the heart of, of what we're trying to do with the King Singers Global Foundation. Um, we have some really exciting projects, um, outreach projects for underprivileged um, people who normally wouldn't get teaching. And we go in and um, give them workshops and masterclasses. And I'll tell you what, when we do those, we leave them with such a wonderful um, sense of the power of music. And um, I certainly feel that one of my highlights has been in the group so far in this first year and a half has been on those occasions where we have done work with our global foundation. Um, and it's it's such a joy. We, If you'd like to find out more about it, you can go onto our website. And if you would be able to support us, we would be so grateful. Yeah, like it's. I think what's what's magical is that these kind of ways in which music brings people joy and harmony manifests itself in very different ways. So we have a project in the UK at the moment. It's called Finding Harmony Live, and it's happening in May. And in it, we've got three Finding Harmony ambassador choirs that we've chosen. One is um, the prison choir project. So it's inmates in prison who are being brought together through song. Um, one is called Sound About, which is for people, predominantly young people with severe um, either learning difficulties or disabilities or mental disabilities. Um, and uh, they are brought together through song um, and are taught how to interact with each other through it and to function as part of a team. And the other one is called, well, the, the largest company is called Together Productions. And within it, there's something called the Mixed Up Chorus, which is designed as a choir for people who don't necessarily feel like they belong anywhere. So the number of nationalities is vast. Some people are nationless. The number of languages spoken is enormous. And yet it's specifically designed that song will bring them together. So like we are bringing 
those three choirs. We're going to work with them for free, and then we're bringing those three choirs together. So already people that wouldn't normally be together coming together, and we're going to be making music with all of them, getting them to sing to each other, getting them to meet each other, and showing them that you know music just has this incredible binding power, and they will hopefully leave very happy, as will we. <laughs> I think <laughs> but that's just one example of kind of us trying to really put into practice what we're saying. Like if we believe this and we have a platform to do it, then we want to try and do it. So that's it. That's fantastic. Tell me a little bit about what this schedule is like between running a global foundation now between the UK and the US and doing 120 concerts a year roundabout. How? When? <laughs> well, um, it's funny you should ask, actually, because um, uh, one of the sort of common questions we get after concerts is, so are you guys doing this full time? Um, <laughs> which we always find slightly amusing because um, it feels like, certainly from what we're doing, that we're working pretty hard. Um, it, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> It's very much a full-time um, job. It's, um, I guess we're just all really, really motivated. You know, as soon as you get, um, you know, as we've mentioned, this group is 52 years old now. Um, and as soon as you get the opportunity to audition and, and in, if you're lucky enough to be, be chosen, like we, we, all we all feel very, very lucky to be a part of this group. Um, and so, you know, particularly we're, we're generally recruited quite young, straight out of college normally. Um, not always. Um, uh, but, um, and so at that stage, you're 20 two, three years old, you've just joined, a, um, you know, purportedly um, a pretty good a cappella group that's pretty well known. Um, and you, so the first feeling is, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. It's a dream job. Um, and then I think you become, after a year or two, you sort of start to realize, OK, this is insane. Um, I'm really enjoying this now. I, I want to give something back. I don't deserve this. You know, um, why are there so many um, you know, people out there who don't have this job. Um, and so um, we make time to do um, what we've got to do, which is um, perform and do all that. But um, to, to, to really, this global foundation and defining harmony has, has felt very natural and indeed um, right to all of us, which sounds like a really weird thing um, to say. Um, and we don't, I don't think we really think about, you know, we don't clock up the hours. We're not in the office from 9 to 5.30. We are constantly um, sort of online, um, doing our bit. We've all got our own individual jobs. Um, the way in which we can manage uh, the amount of time we, we put out is by um, having individual roles within the group. Um, so um, as I think Johnny mentioned earlier, we are a partnership. Um, so um, we can really work together as a team. But um, it's th the motivation is, is really just from that of trying to help people and giving back t um, this kind of amazing musical um, kind of position that we have probably say that Jules actually keeps us on the straight and narrow from day to day because he's the one who manages our schedule when we're on tour, <laughs> which is an extremely important job. But I would just like to add that I think what makes it possible is our friendship. And um, we make each other laugh many, many, many times a day. Too much. Yeah, probably too much. Um, and, that, and that really means that this job where we're away from family and loved ones for long, long periods of time, thank goodness we have video calls nowadays, um, but it makes it possible and wonderful to spend time with these people. And I mean, I think the skills in my colleagues are it's just in I'm in awe of all the abilities that they have thank you which, thank you <laughs> <laughs> which which does mean that we can we can you know work really really well as a sort of high performing team which is which is wonderful that's fantastic do you want to well, I was like, sh shall we yes yeah, we sing something yeah. but apparently we're a high performing team so let's see if we can perform <laughs> highly performing yeah. Time to put that word to the test um, I was gonna say is there anyone here from scale ability Yes. Hey, yeah. Woo. This is, nice. this is your own a cappella group, I understand, with the best name in the history of names. Um, um, the New so York one. We're not going to throw shade at the other offices, but we're kind of the best. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. Um, I thought maybe for those, particularly those of you who are in a cappella groups, or maybe, maybe you've come because you're interested in music, we could talk a little bit about the sound that we make. Um, as well as you know what's going on behind the scenes, is talk a little bit about the way we create a sort of signature sound because there are thousands and thousands of a cappella groups around and it's quite hard to to find your own USP. We're lucky that, that it started so long ago that there's a sort of DNA in our sound which which we can sort of carry on. But this next song that we're going to sing is a really good example of um, the sort of uh, quintessential King Singer sound, which is. <laughs> Maybe someone else should describe it. I'll shut up for a bit. No, 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 do it. It's, it's, <laughs> do it's, um, it, it should be sort of inviting and warm. None of us sings hugely loudly from, from within the group. We sing sort of 
at a medium dynamic, but the effect of our voices combined, blended, is such that it should feel really warm and like you're getting into a warm bath is what people people have often said. Um, and so this next song is an is a folk song where for lots of the piece, we're all singing exactly the same words at the same time. And we sing them in quite a delicate way with quite um, clear diction at the front of the mouth. And we use quite a soft type of tone because within your voice, you can sing really harsh and stridently through to something really fluffy. Um, think Billy. How do you demonstrate? Just hard uh, not, not today. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hear. Um, you, yeah, you will hear it. And, and, and for this, we try and make a sort of a blended corporate sound by taking some of the edges off, taking a little bit of the personality out of each voice to make it sound like one instrument while we're singing. Um, I don't know, maybe you can give us some feedback after we finish because <laughs> it's scary setting it up like that. But there we go. Uh -huh. This one is, um, do you want to yeah, introduce so this it? This is called Dance to Thy Daddy and it's an English folk song which is a big part of the King Sings repertoire and we really, really love singing folk songs. And it paints life in an English fishing village in the 19th century. And there's a lot of dancing, a lot of drinking and a lot of fish. Dance to the daddy, sing to the mammy. Dance to the daddy, to the mammy, sing. Come here, my little Jackie, now we smoke me backy. Let's have a bit of cracky till the pot comes in. Dance, dance to the daddy, sing to the mammy. Dance, dance to the daddy, to the mammy, sing. Dance, 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 dance to the daddy, sing. Dance, dance, dance to the mammy, sing. Have a fishy, call the little dishy. I'll have a fishy when the boat comes in. Here's the mother humming like a canny woman. Yonder comes the father he drunk. Can't not stand. Dance to the daddy, sing to the mammy. Dance, 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 dance to the daddy, sing to the mammy. Sing to the daddy, sing to the mammy. 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 Sing to the m
thought, wow, actually, uh, there's there's four of us who have come in um, from people who had been doing the job for anywhere between 17 and 26 years, which is a huge legacy. And so certainly I felt a little bit mm. at at the beginning, a little bit burdened by the kind of the, the, the thought of, wow, 18 years, how, how could I ever live up to what people's expectations have been? Because over 18 years, there's a whole lot of people who have come into uh, the group as, as a fan who would only know him in that lineup, you know? And so, so what do you do if you're, in, if you're the new kid on the block? So I, I was encouraged to be myself and to bring my Kiwiness. I was a, I'm a proud, proud New Zealander, and, um, but with, with um, my, my mother was uh, from England, so I have dual citizenship, and I'm, I'm proud to be both. Um, but when it comes to rugby and cricket, it's very much New Zealand. Um, <laughs> you probably don't know what how cricket is. How did it go uh, for you in the World <laughs> Cup, then, Bruce? Yeah, let's not talk about the World Cup. Um, <laughs> One of it, um, uh, moving swiftly along. But yeah, so, so for me, it's a kind of a case of what, what can I bring, which is not Phil Lawson, as much as I love him, but it's what's, what's Chris Brewers and, 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 and how can I find my place? And eight years in, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable as to where I fit in and uh, as a kind of caretaker of the baritone one role before I hand it on to the next person to, to bring their sort of thoughts to the job. There's one interesting thing, I think, which which we talked about when we were celebrating our 50th anniversary a few years ago, which is um, about how to preserve some of the spirit of the original guys. Because when they started out in 1968, there was genuinely nothing really quite like this. And they were they almost sort of created a new genre in, in choral music in doing this. And so inherent in what they set up was something original and innovative and new and fresh. And so there's always that juxtaposition or sort of balance to be had between preserving the traditions that got passed down from from those people through to us versus maintaining the spirit that started it, which is innovative, uh, fresh, new, um, dynamic. And so I think that's an, an interesting one, is trying to remain creative and remain at the front of our industry like those original guys were, whilst not disrespecting the thing that they set up. The, the two sides of the coin are a really interesting balance for us. I think, that's I, th said. I think also what, what helps is that King Singers have tended to stay for long periods of time. People have been very loyal to the group. And that's quite rare, I think, in, in the industry. And it, it means that we can pass those traditions down and those styles of singing down much more effectively. Um, I think the average length tenure is about 10 years. Is that right? Oh ten, no. 12 years. Okay. So people tend to stay be between 10 and 15 years. And the longest, I think you said, is 26, which is completely amazing, really. Um, so it's wonderful to feel at the, the, the newer end of, of that body of knowledge and to learn so much. We have a question. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Sure. One, uh, sort of playing off that, I was wondering how active the alumni are. Um, I know for a lot of a lot of singing groups, there's a lot of, you know, alumni reunions and things. I didn't know whether that was something that happened or whether that would be too intimidating on the current members. <laughs> and then my other question was, um, okay. you have such great blend and intonation and all that, and I didn't know, is that just because they pick really great singers that <laughs> sing well together? Or do you have particular exercises or things you do to make sure that you blend well and, and all of that? Great questions. So with the alumni, um, we... Uh, we have a really good relationship with them, actually. Um, particularly, um, which is uh, something more applicable to the current lineup uh, around the, the 50th anniversary, uh, just before um, Nick and Eddie's time. But um, we decided that was a great opportunity um, to invite all the uh, the alumni back. We had a, a, a large reunion event um, at the spiritual home of, of, of King's College, Cambridge, uh, which is where the original guys in 68 were all students. Um, so we had a dinner there, and we invited everyone, and uh, most of them made it, um, and even from America. Um, and uh, and since then, it's really re um, kind of uh, rejuvenated a, a wonderful connection with them. And and we've been reflecting on this recently, actually. Um, but the connection to the originals and the former members is really important. Um, it's like a family, really. They are you know the originals are basically our grandparents, the Kingsley's granddaddies, if you like. Um, and uh, and this, they've got a whole wealth of experience, knowledge. The stories are amazing. But also, they've gone on after they've finished in the group to do amazing things, you know, um, start new choirs. Um, you know, Simon Carrington spent a, a good number of years at, at Yale um, doing awesome things there. Um, all, all sorts, you know, all the, all the guys have gone on to do um, interesting, different things within, generally within the world of music, some in, in, um, in broadcasting as well. 
So, um, yeah, we can learn a lot from that, and we're very grateful to them. I'll pass on to the second question to someone else. I think the key thing in answer to your blend balance intonation thing is we are, I, I hope we are decent singers. No one's got a horrible voice, at least. But we're not the world's best six sing, sing best, oh, that's a dangerous one to get wrong. The best six singers in the world by any stretch. The thing that we are able to do is to listen to each other really well. And more key to making our sound, I think, particularly in the realms of intonation and balance and blend, is that we are willing to, to lend our ears to the project as much as our voices. And in in the purpose of trying to create this one instrument sound is not project our own musical or vocal egos into the mix too much and be willing to to ride the way that the group goes and i think it wouldn't be um unfair to say that through the course of a concert not every piece stays immaculately in tune every time and it might drift up or might drift down don't but tell them that <laughs> but the uh, the secret That's is auto tunes for <laughs> <laughs> but but the secret is that we stay in tune with ourselves, like a sort of swarm of birds don't fly in a straight line, but they, they follow each other really neatly and they stay as a pack. But our pitch doesn't waver that much. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. Hope that answers it. We have another question. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Uh, you talked about how you're using, you know, whether it's Spotify or YouTube or social media to engage with audiences, which is fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and we just talked about auto-tuning. So I was actually curious whether or not you actually are using software or tech in ways to produce music, or whether it's learning music or recording an album, uh, and how to strike the delicate balance of not overdoing it, which we know can happen as well. Yeah, well, the group, um, is, I think it's fair to say, a couple of decades ago were, were again, at the forefront of the sort of te recording technology um, for a cappella music, they would uh, often like multi-track themselves to give this sort of awesome sort of choral reverb effect. Um, and uh, uh, since then, lots of um, amazing a cappella groups from around the world um, have, have been doing that as well. So recently, we've decided to sort of like scale back to to the to one uh, like one of our USPs, which is hopefully being able to to do to do that live. So we record everything in a room, all six of us together, round microphones, not one at a time, and then micro-tuning, and, um, and we just, we take the best takes that, we, that we've recorded. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, learning repertoire, we, we, we tend to just do it, do it from, the, from our own a cappella recordings. Um, um, I think that's, that's it's a nice sort of, you connect to a heart of, of the music through, through that. Um, and I think once you get too far down the rabbit hole of, of um, Melodyne and, and uh, mic micro-tuning things, um, you, can, you can risk losing a bit of the soul, I personally think. Yeah, I think we agree with that. One, one cool project that I wasn't part of, and one of my colleagues who maybe explain it in more detail, is actually um, the cover of our album, um, Finding Harmony, is actually a, v a, v an, a visual representation of our sound. So we recorded... Um, one day, which is, is it the first track on the album? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. opening track on the album. Um, and then we sent it to a collaborator of ours, who I'll, I'll let Johnny talk a bit more about it, and he created a whole sort of song of artwork that goes alongside it. So that's actually our, a visu visual representation of our singing. It's funny, because that actually links me back to Google. I had a big conversation with your Google Better team out in um, California a while ago, because we were doing this project um, about the intersection of music and art and technology and working with a guy who is an artist slash coder called Felix Fair based in the UK. Um, and he has done a lot to try and visually represent sound, has worked with Imogen Heap and various other people. And we wanted to see, <coughs> could we do something where we could kind of create live art out of live performance? And so on our actual 50th birthday, on the 1st of May, 19, 2018, sorry, we... Um, did this project in a in a church crypt in London with um, this big gauze hanging in front of us. And as we were singing, um, dependent on diction and pitch and dynamic, things which are really, really specifically attuned to voices, not just like, um, you know, when you see symphony orchestras and it's about sort of note and, and volume. This was really about the human voice. Um, for different pieces, it was represented in different ways, but there was sort of live art happening directly in front of us on this kind of completely transparent, um, gauze while we were singing so it was kind of a two-layered thing anyway it's very much in the vein of finding harmony finding harmony isn't just about bringing people together but for us also about bringing kind of cultural disciplines together so what better than the front than to take the final chord from the very first track on the album it's, it's a song by Michel Legrand it's called One Day and it's a song all about hope and 
give that to Felix and see like can you make something which kind of visually shows kind of the voices coming together so that it kind of finding harmony on a single layered thing could sound like quite a trite title for an acapella album but actually like there are lots of layers here where it shows that it's really about seeing all the ways in which harmony can be made manifest from everything from the cover to the track listing to the way we sing it there we are one more question yeah um my question is about your place in the choral community. You guys are obviously pretty well known, and I wonder if you do any sort of outreach to kind of spread lessons that you've learned over 50 plus years of, of like working together as such a close team and like how you try to spread those lessons to other. other yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I agree. As a former teacher myself, uh, one of the great joys in this job is to give back. and. Um, I miss teaching in the classroom a lot, but I I get so many opportunities e each year with these guys to 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 teach. Whether that's in a an hour long masterclass uh, like we did last night in Ithaca before we drove and arrived here after midnight sometime, um, and uh, or that could be as as long as a six day residential uh, summer school uh, where we're teaching after breakfast until dinner um, every day. Um, so if any of you are interested um, in joining us and spending six days eating breakfast, lunch and dinner yeah. and having some, having some fun together, um, that'll be uh, in Princeton uh, at the end of June. Um, so I wasn't planning on doing a plug, but, um, here, but here we go, bec <laughs> because you asked. Um, and that's really amazing because the last summer school we did in Cambridge last year had uh, the most uh, different nationalities that we'd ever had. 21 nationalities, so that was really cool, um, and uh, and and we put individuals together into an ensemble, and then we teach them. And it's amazing that these people who have never met before can can somehow find a way to work through some of our um, guiding principles in terms of how to be a, an a cappella ensemble, um, how to listen, essentially. Um, that by the end of the week they are a fully functioning ensemble making amazing music and uh, all unconducted and just listening. And it's, pre it's pretty inspiring to see people. I think they surprise themselves um, at, at how, how it can be done because they, they are in their own choirs and their own places slogging away every week and here they are in six days making incredible music. Some of the people that we work with in Cambridge told us afterwards how it was kind of quite life-changing for them in a way. Some of them were going through difficult times and coming together in a safe space to sing together and be and learn and open their hearts to this to this discipline was something that was uh, very very powerful for them and for us. I mean, it's definitely one of my most um, wonderful experiences. I was terrified of doing teaching before I joined this job, but the week in Cambridge last year, and I'm so looking forward to Princeton. It's going to be wonderful. Can I, can I just make a small a small point, which kind of refers back to a question you asked earlier, um, Nick, um, which is um, you, you were talking about the partnership element and how it's similar to, to you guys at Google and your teams. But I think actually, funny enough, if we can work on those guiding principles that we've learned from the last 52 years um, of King Singers being around, um, through the musical as aspect of that, I think, you know, which is to say, all um, Pat was saying earlier, almost listening more than you're giving your own voice. Um, it kind of musically, we're working together as such a tight team on stage that off stage, those kind of same principles manifest themselves through our work that we're doing. So our individual jobs within the team, um, as, as long as we're getting on with those, um, at the end of the day, it's kind of the, the, the team, the overall effect, which, um, which is so powerful. So it's kind of, I think if we stick to, it goes to show how, um, doing music, singing together can be really great, not just for music making, but actually for life and for, for kind of social things and, and life disciplines, I think. Fantastic. We've got another question. Would you mind if we sang a song first? No. We've, we've got a time limit and I'd love to hear your question, but should we just sing our penultimate tune? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were gonna yeah. sing one more very famous folk song that doesn't need introducing, so we won't introduce it. <laughs> Tis you, tis you, must go and I must. 
passed by. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow. Oh, when the valley's hushed and white with snow. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little about how you rehearse and when you learn a new song, how much time you spend rehearsing it. Great question. Um, we probably, over the course of a year, probably offer about 10 different programs. So that'll be 10 two-hour long shows, um, which is obviously quite a lot of repertoire. Um, as we're on the road lots of the time, um, we have about a, um, uh, a couple of days, maybe a term of, a uh, couple of days per term rehearsing um, for the upcoming tours and shows. And then when we're on the road, we'll have um, up to two hours a day um, to rehearse for the, that night's show and then any music that's coming up in the future. Um, so uh, sometimes we'll be singing a, an awesome show of love songs and we have to be rehearsing some obscure Georgian 10th century repertoire. And it's, it's quite amazing, disparate, um, disparate uh, musical existence at times. Um, but it's great. It sort of keeps us um, trickling along like that. Seeing as we see each other so much of the time, uh, it's nice to rehearse on the road. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I just wondered uh, how much of your music um, do you arrange yourselves? And of that, are there certain individuals who do the arrangements? Do you work together? How does that work? Yeah, we, we do a little bit of that. That's, that's quite an important part of our sort of our institution's DNA. Thanks for your question. It, um, is yeah, ever since the early days, is people within the group with um, the interest and the skills to do it um, writing arrangements because no one knows how we work um, and our voices better than the people in the in the team at any given time. So quite often we do ask external composers and arrangers to help us out, and we we ask them to arrange a certain song. But where we have the time and the willingness, we do do it ourselves. And I think in the current team, Nick. Chris and I are the three who probably do the most of it. And on the last couple of albums, um, there's been arrangements by by the three of us in there. Um, but I mean, it's also a joy to collaborate with other arrangers and they often bring a new and interesting voice. Um, and I think, for example, the final song that we're gonna sing in a bit, whenever that may be, um, is by someone we've never had an arrangement from before, a Mexican guy called Jorge. 
and he did something incredible with the song. And I think if we had chosen to arrange that song in-house, we would never have got to the incredible place that he got to with the fresh perspective. So there's sort of two sides to it, but it's definitely something we enjoy doing and it's valuable to us. I will say, unfortunately, we're about out of time. So I want to make sure I get a chance to plug. And then if you want to give that final number, you can feel free. Please, uh, kingsingers.com. Kingsingers on Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Facebook. Uh, Spotify and Apple Music, and you can go on to kingsingers.com for your upcoming tour dates. These guys are around the world, so please check them out. Um, please give them another round of applause. Thank you again for coming and performing. If you'd love to close this out, please feel free. Yeah, well, just on that note, um, if you go onto our website and click on the concerts page, you'll find out that the next concert is tomorrow in New York City. So we may as well tell you now. Uh, we are, we're doing a show called Audience with the Kingsingers at St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue, and there's still tickets available. It's, I don't know if you guys have been in there, but it's a very, very beautiful space with an incredible musical tradition going on there all the time. So if any of you happen to be around, we'd love to see you there, and please introduce yourself afterwards. We'd love to say hi. Um, final song? Someone else talk about it. Um, Go on, right. So this is also from Finding Harmony. Um, it's a song from Mexico, and it's a song that was written in the 19th century and is now basically a Mexican second national anthem. Um, and what we love about it is that it's a song that kind of works in so many different occasions. It's a song that m works in times of triumph. We all heard it like when during the Soccer World Cup in 2018, Mexico kind of like, I think it was it unexpectedly beat Sweden, I think was it? Germany. Germany, Germany. that's right. No, we unexpectedly beat Sweden, that was right. Uh, uh, <laughs> Germany, yeah, there we were to remember. And um, yeah, this came up from the from the stadium, and then likewise during the earthquake in 2017 in Mexico City, this song was heard kind of coming from the streets as people search for bodies in the rubble. So it, it's a, an example of finding harmony kind of happening in so many different contexts. Uh, and some of you may know it. It's called Cielito Lindo. Uh. Esperanza, mantente firme que no lloren tus ojos al despedirme que no lloren te pido porque si miro la 
lágrimas en tus ojos, no me despido. Pero mi domingo se litorito, la 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 cuando será domingo se litorito, la 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 la